modern society, mobile phones, it narrows the focus and it narrows the attention to a very small space. Yeah? And so we walk around like this with our heads down all the time and you've got anything but situational awareness. Now that's the first thing you develop because that's the first thing that is going to save you. Changes in the environment, especially you know, for you guys, it's when people give you funny looks and those kind of things. That's the first stage in you becoming aware that there's something in the environment that is changing. Yeah? So the first thing that we have to look at is our awareness of what's going on around us. And your first awareness is that, of course, it's, it currently the, the country's in a, um, uh, in a certain state, isn't it? Trials and tribulations. Trials and tribulations. So we know that the country's kind of heading in a certain direction, so that should be your first level of awareness. Yeah? Um, when your awareness has failed, that's when you have to come to the point where you're kind of using this stuff. Yeah? Now I say, well, certainly I think you can all agree with this, that one of the best ways of um, uh, not being stabbed is by not hanging around with people who carry knives and not carrying a knife yourself. Yeah? Um, so if you ever get to the point where you're having to apply this stuff, it's because something in your awareness, something in your radar, if you want to call it a radar, has let you down so that people who want to cause you harm can get close enough to you. Now, what we tend to believe is that we're more sensitive at the front when we're not actually, we're more sensitive from behind because there was a time when a lot of animals might have attacked us and stuff like that. So because our eyes face forward, most of our sensitivity is from behind. Now, I'm sure that um, most people in here have experienced this um, thing where you look to your right or you look to your left and somebody's looking at you. Yeah? You ever felt that? Sometimes you're sitting in your car, you're driving, all of a sudden you look and you think, you're not sure why you looked, but somebody's looking at you. Yeah? Now, what happens is, is modern living kills these kind of... Sorry, lays down these kind of instincts and says that they're not useful anymore. But I'm here to tell you that regardless of the changes in science, technology, and this and the other, humans are always going to be the same. Yeah? So we all come ready, born ready, to protect ourselves. Yeah? And all we're helping you do is remember. Yeah? Not necessarily learn um, things that we outside of the ranges of human movement, um, but you already kind of come with the ability to protect yourself and all I'm doing and all me and this man are going to do is reawaken that. Yeah? Um, the principles that we use are very, very simple, right? i.e. movement and deflection. Yeah? Quite often the problem is, is if you see the knife, you want to take the knife, right? But in taking the knife, this is quite often where we get hurt. What we have to understand, like this man says, is that the knife on its own isn't really that dangerous. So if I just do a little experiment and I say, fetch, kill, it doesn't move. It needs the person behind it to move the, the knife. So this is the area that needs to be shut down. Yeah? So you notice that as we're doing our work, Ishmael doesn't cling to the knife. Yeah? He lets the knife pass him by so he can get to the access to, to, to the access the person which is the quickest way of ending the situation, right? Now, if you want to go and look like Steven Seagal, go and copy Steven Seagal. Go and copy Bruce Lee. Go and copy all those people for the movies and see how far it gets, yeah? What we want to understand is that interaction with violence is more like a language than it is a procedure. Does that make sense, yeah? The, procedure, the problem is, is when we take a procedural approach, Quite often, if the situation doesn't fit the procedure, then all of a sudden, you don't know what to do, yeah? Whereas what we've been learning here is a language of interaction with a dynamic environment as it unfolds in front of you, yeah? Sorry, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to do a few um, more demonstrations from the key areas, front, back, and sides, yeah? Um, uh, quite often, people who are attacking you, they want to make it easy for themselves. That's why they come around the back. That's why they come around the sides, because they want to maximise. They want to minimise the, the risk of damage to themselves. Yeah, and so it's quite a natural phenomenon that you see people getting attacked from beside, from the sides, attacked from behind, and all those kind of things. So we're going to look at covering all of those areas. We've got areas that directly go in towards the centre line. And we've got work that cuts across the centre line. Slashes, stabs, and 
hacks. Yeah, these are the three main sort of um, areas that people are attacking. And as this Mel said, a lot of people, all they do is they take a knife out of the kitchen drawer and they say, right, well, I'm going to walk with it. They've not had any kind of formal training or anything themselves. But how much formal training do you need to use a knife? Not necessarily a lot. Yeah. So the things that we're going to show you today are not necessarily a guarantee. Yeah. And one of your always, always one of your best forms of self-defense is preemptive. Is not getting into trouble in the first place. Yeah. Um, but should you get into trouble, hopefully we show you a few things that you can go away and maybe practice or join a group and learn from a group. It's always better to learn that way. Yeah. So we're just going to run through a few areas concerning stabs. We're going to look at stabs from the front, stabs from the side, stabs from the back. Then we're going to move on to dealing with slashes. Yeah? Okay? No, thank you. I'll just put this down a minute while we just do the demo. Yeah? <coughs> so here, there, and you see how Ismail goes straight towards control. Yeah? It's after the fact, after he's dealt with me, that he starts to try and take the knife. Yeah? Some of the worst or Hollywood things that we see, you know, is this kind of, you know, this kind of stuff. That's the most difficult. Yeah? The stuff you see in the movies, it's in the movies for a reason, is to make you excited. Yeah? When, as you know, the real fighting, real interaction, sometimes it's smooth and sometimes it's raw. Yeah? And we have to accept that. It's not always going to be as easy as you think it's going to be. Yeah? So again, access the head, take control, and then he starts to work on the knife. Um, like anything, as Ismail said before, I guarantee that your first car wasn't a Ferrari. Yeah? I guarantee that your first car wasn't even something fast. I would say that your first car was probably a Polo, or a Clio, or something like that for the older ones, a Metro, yeah? if you remember that. Right? Um, but my point is that if you were to learn in a Ferrari, you'd be dead. <laughs> so there's a learning process that has to start slow and then you build up the speed. Yeah? So, very nice. And there you go. A certain amount of wrist control and control in the elbow. But it's an understanding of biomechanical principles. Say, for example, Ishmael stabs and I have to get, not only am I using my movement, but I would like to get something between me and him. Yeah? Quite often, that might be the arm. So the arm deflects. But if we look, his elbow is already in a bad position. So I can attack him here. Yeah? There. That's the first movement. And we see that what happens is it disrupts the structure of Ismail's body. From there, I can start to take the advantage now because Ismail is in a bad position and I'm in a good position. So there could be any number of things that I can do. I've got access to the head, so if I pull the chin away from the knife, then what happens is, is it causes a lot of strain at the base of the neck just here. Yeah? Um, it, not, it doesn't take a lot of pressure there to really cause a lot of damage. So I can control him here, no problem. Yeah? Why? Because there's a fear of breaking the neck. So you're creating the fear of him um, getting a greater damage himself. Does that make sense? Yeah? Because I've got better position. Yeah? So as I've got better position, Ismail, um, with poor position, it's easy for me to deal with him. I've got control of the head, so I might start to control the legs now. Boom! Yeah? And you see what happens? The leg collapses. That's the only thing that's supporting him in this position. From there, you might see little things. Here, there, and there. Yeah? From here, I've got control of the shoulder, which gives me access to the rest of his body. Yeah? From here, if I push really hard, what's going to happen? He's going to break his shoulder. Yeah? Very nice. Yeah? And the same is for me. Just because I'm the instructor, it doesn't mean that I take this lofty position where he isn't allowed to do things. I need to, um, I need to still keep practicing myself. Yeah? So from here, you see that awareness and movement are his biggest friends, yeah? Not techniques and moves, yeah? So for example, we start to get a little bit more, with, this is a quick thing to learn, a very easy thing to learn, but master it 
like anything else, comes over time. Yeah? So from here, I've got control of the elbow, I've got control of the fingers. I can use that to control him and place him in what direction I wish to place him. Yeah? Which is on the floor with me standing up. Because some of the best knife defence, as far as I'm concerned, works like this. Yeah? Right? So, <laughs> for me, um, the idea of getting into a, a lengthy, drawn out confrontation is dangerous for me. Because if he stabs and I don't do anything, what's he going to do? He's going to stab again. Yeah? So the idea is I need to end this situation as quickly as possible. So I'm going to show you a couple of real simple things. Yeah? The stab comes in, I move the knife, I control the head, I put him down on the floor, and then I run. <laughs> yeah? Um, again, control the head, yeah? And you start to see what happens. He's in a real bad position as far as I'm concerned because he can't see me, yeah? And of course, I could probably put a lot of distance between me and him before he gets up, yeah? Now, it doesn't really matter um, about the position of the person. The aim is to avoid the knife and control the person, yeah? So here, there, you see, there, there, and there. Yeah. Worst place for you, for you to be lying on the floor on your front, because this is where he's got the least awareness of the situation, yeah? So again, you cover 360 degrees, yeah, um, in terms of the midline. So now let's look at um, the hack. Now, uh, domestically, this is the most common type of attack, yeah? Um, criminally, this is the most common type of attack. You see, he's already ready to move, yeah? Um, so it's very important that we understand those things, right? Because the escape for this and the escape for that are the same. You have to use displacement. Now displacement means that I'm moving my body from one position to another position. Yeah? Um, so you see where the simplicity lies in the fact that whether it's a punch, whether it's a stab, or whether it's an overhand hack, the responses in terms of Ishmael are the same. Yeah? Even if that's a gun, yeah? the same position that he needs to adopt for fists, for feet, for, ha uh, for knives, is the same movement. It's just the consequences are different. Yeah? So the consequences of me punching Ishmael are greater than the consequences of me stabbing Ishmael. That's the only difference, <coughs> but the movements are the same. So we're going to look at a couple of attacks from the overhand hack now. And let's see what Ishmael's responses are. Now, the, the thing is, the beauty about um, Sistema is that um, it recognises that Ishmael and Ed are two different individuals. And um, the way Ishmael likes to work might not be the way that I like to work. But we're still bound by the same principles. Yeah? Um, so, here, there, there, very nice. Yeah? And you see that very, very quickly, he deals with the situation, yeah? So again, here, yeah? Control the head. From here, as I pull him backwards, because you've got to remember that his energy was going in the opposite direction. So this is why his hips are tilted forward, but his head is back. Now, all I need from here is a little pull, and he's gone, yeah? Because the, the posterior chain, all the muscles in the back and the back of the legs, when you do that, they lock up. Yeah? And so it's easy to pull him down from that position. Yeah? Very nice. So again, overhand, control the head. This time, I've got a different position. But my legs are quite close to Ishmael's legs. So it might be that I just attack the knee. How many times have you done that at school? When you're waiting for dinner, and your friends come up to you and they go, Hey! And you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, this kind of thing, yeah? So I'm not showing you anything that you don't already know. Yeah? So here, there, <coughs> and there. Very nice. So again, here, there, boom, here. And again, a different position that I can control the head. So you see the idea over principles versus techniques. 
Yeah, this isn't a technique, this is a principle. And let's see what we've got. So I might have his legs here, I can control his arm here, I can control his arm there, I'll ask him to drop the knife. Yeah. That's beautiful. Say again? It's not technique, right? Because this may never happen again. Does that make sense? Because we're working within principles, it's, it's not um, a technique. It's more like a language. So that means that you might repeat something, but you might not be able to ever repeat again. Yeah? So, for example, here, there, and there. He controlled the shoulders and made me top heavy. My centre of gravity was high. Yeah? Um, so I tell you, we move on to slashes. Yeah? Now the thing is about slashes, they try to come across and cut in half. So what we need to do is first and foremost is move the part of the body that he's trying to cut. Yeah? And that was pretty easy. How many times have you been to the gym and done this? Yeah? Yeah, you see, very easy. If you can do that, then you can do this. Yeah? Um, so again, then I might start to work where things are a little bit closer to me. So if we just rewind, the slash came in here, I made sure that it went over my head. In doing so, his knee was quite close to me, so I take control of the knee. This starts to bring him down. From there, I might change to the legs, yeah? and then from here, you start to see that it's quite easy to control him by strategically placing the feet. Yeah? And this is painful for him, because I'm not wearing shoes, it feels quite nice. It feels like a massage. Yeah? But when I'm wearing shoes, this is very painful. So of course, here, there, and there, then I'll take it home, yeah? But um, be mindful that if you... <coughs> what is it? When you watch too many movies, this happens. Yeah? Oh, here, yeah, there, yeah, you know. I want it to look like the movies. It's not going to be like that. You have to face the realities of what things could be like. Here, there, there, very nice. Yeah? So you start to develop an understanding of how the body works or doesn't work. Sorry, sir. So you're face to face. Yeah. Is there a way for us to differentiate between a start and a slash? Well, by his movement. So if we just look, the initial stages of what you pick up, the problem is, is we wait till it's moving before we decide what it is. So if he's going to do an overhand hat, you see that you see the shape of what he's doing. Yeah? You see the shape of what he's doing, and that's the point where you act. Everything, and I'm sure you guys know even more than me. Everything in this universe has got one thing in common. It's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah? So if you drive up to traffic lights, you don't wait for them to change. If it's green, you just keep going through. You, you know. Um, so my point is, is that you recognise the shape of what he's doing, and then you operate accordingly there. And that's the bit that takes experience. Yeah? Um, so, for example, it doesn't take long to recognise the shape of what he's doing. So if he wants to do a slash, yeah, there, you see there's a change. Yeah? If he wants to do a stab, you see what happens. There's a difference in the height of his elbow. There's an indicator as to what he's going to do. Yeah? Now you start to pick up the signs and symptoms in the same way that a doctor does. Yeah? Um, so your doctor goes, oh, you've got a runny nose, you've got runny eyes, it looks to me like you've got a cold. We pick up the signs and symptoms of what he's doing really, uh, really early on as well. Does that make sense? Yeah? So it's the shape, or as they say, the shape of things to come. So I observe his position, and then I act accordingly based around that. Yeah? The problem is, is with anticipation in that case. So I might think I can anticipate what he's going to do. <laughs> and if I get it wrong, then it's only going to make it easier for him. So look at the shape of what he's going to do, and then you respond accordingly, yeah? And it's really, you start seeing the shape. For example, if we're going empty hands, I want this little experiment we can all kind of do together. When you think, what you, when you, think you know what I'm going to do, call it out, yeah? Right? You see what I mean? So you see how easily you recognise the shapes and signs of what the person's going to do. Right? And that's the point that you operate. You don't wait until it becomes a kick. You start to see the early signs of it developing, and that's where you operate. Now, the problem is, is it's like any martial art. If there's a martial artist in here, you have to understand that the chances of you meeting another you 
are very, very slim because most martial artists don't want to go out and cause trouble. So any training of any form is good for you. Yeah? The thing is, we see everything in here as a third party thing. I'm telling you what you're going to do, I'm giving you the solutions, and I'm giving you the answer, uh, so I'm giving you the problem, I'm giving you the solution and the answer. Outside of there is very different. Yeah? The, the other guy, if he knew what you could do, he probably would pick on somebody else anyway. So this is all to your advantage. And if you notice, one thing we haven't got is angry faces. Yeah? You don't see angry faces. This isn't, forgive me, Krav Maga. Yeah? Um, where everything's angry faces. There's a good reason for that. Yeah? Sorry, the sisters can't hear you. Oh, sorry. You need to put your, you need to put your mic on. Oh, sorry, sorry. I thought I had a big mouth. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's not big enough. Um, no, we can hear you, but the sisters can't hear you. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I do apologise. Um, uh, so you see that what we're looking to do is pick things up in the origins of, the, of things that change the environment. It's a little bit sometimes like walking into a room and you know when people have been talking about it. Anybody experience that? Yeah, you walk into a room and all of a sudden it goes quiet, right? And that's, that's your instincts kicking in. That's you um, starting to pick things up on another level. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah? And so this is the kind of world that we live in, right? What we're actually doing is we're training the subconscious. So we're training the subconscious response, right? Um, the, the problem is, is sometimes the cognitive process is too slow. Does that make sense? Um, uh, yeah, very much so. Very much like driving. So, first, sorry, sorry. Right, so now you've demonstrated what you do with a knife. Say somebody's actually got physically holding you, your, your bum, from the back maybe. You know, okay, very nice. So somebody's got hold of your clothes. Okay, I'll try, bro, I'll try. You won't remember I'm a dinosaur. Yeah. Okay. So, you may be having to work, um, like I said before, is that okay? Mark, check it. Yeah? Uh, hang on, sorry. Um, people may make contact with you. There's a stage to everything, beginning, middle, and uh, after, right? So let's say there's different stages you have to work at. We can work from the worst place back, i.e. he's already grabbed me. Now, if somebody's already grabbed you, what's the disadvantages for them and the advantages for you? Both of his hands are tied up, whereas both of my hands are free. Um, which is going to make it really easy for me, because all I have to do... Sorry, Shmel. Yeah? All I have to do is operate on him, because both his hands are tied up. Yeah? Plus, also, he's in what's called reaction, he's at reaction zone. Where whatever I do, he can't react. Yeah? Because I'm too close. So there's other ways in which I can work. Yeah? Right? Which mean that I can tie him up real good. Yeah? But it's all based around his own actions. Does that make sense? Yeah? Um, so it might be that you know you could grab another way. Um, oh, yeah? This is quite a common grab. Uh, the thing is, disadvantages again are I might have one of my arms tied up, he's got both his hands tied up, but also I can move around this pretty well. If I'm tense, then it makes him tense, it makes him strong. Uh, but if I'm not tense, then he's got other things he has to deal with. So it's quite easy for me to see how I'm gonna escape from that. Yeah? Um, also, to understand that humans outside of this environment are very, very different. So you start to acknowledge a lot more out there than you do in here. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah? Because you know what's coming in here. Um, so it might be that you're in the worst positions. You, you move, sorry. <laughs> Your movement is difficult, it's restricted, so I certainly can't back out that way. One of my arms is tied up, but then I've still got the rest of my body that I can move. Yeah? Bang! <laughs> um, here, there, there, and then there, I start to work. Yeah? But the disadvantage for him started when he had the idea. Does that make sense? So in our world, he's dead. Sorry, sorry. Um, he's in a bad way. He's the only person who doesn't know it. Yeah? Yeah? And so. I notice, and I don't mean to be disrespectful if I do this, but I notice that you guys have got beards. Yeah? One good way of controlling somebody might be through these kind of things. And again, we look at the issues of hair. So I grab this now, yeah? and he's got, he can work with my hair very nice. There's nothing that's really kind of off limits. Let's say we get grabs from behind. Yeah? Um, these are the most uncomfortable ones because sometimes I can't see what's going on. One option is to drop here, there, and there, yeah? 
because I gave him a greater fear than holding on. Does that make sense? Yeah? yeah? I mean, one of the common grabs on the back is a truck. They're coming in and... Yeah, they're rear really naked. Yeah? yeah? Now, like anything else, if he gets to this stage... Oh, yeah, if he gets to this stage, it's going to be even more difficult. But you apply it properly. Yeah? Uh, first and foremost, he's not a good position. But again, forgive me for doing this, but he's not so hard to escape from. Yeah? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, so you're okay. <laughs> right? Because what I did was I gave him a greater fear than holding on here. Yeah? But ideally, your sensitivity will allow you to start escaping as the person's applying it. Yeah? Now, um, again, what we tend to want to do is work from worst case scenario, i.e., the guy's already got it on. But there's so much bigger stuff than that. First and foremost, he's only letting me do that by consent because he's training. Yeah? If I try and put him in a hole now, you see what happens? Yeah? So what starts, what starts to happen is, is that this form of training um, is very instinctive and it gets that way very quick because I'm not showing you anything you can't already do. Yeah? Now when it comes to the sisters, um, quite often the problem is, is for a male is that they suffer from the fatal flaw of the male ego. You know, for example, uh, Ishmael isn't as tall as me, so I think, oh, he's small, I can take his dinner money. That's the first line of attack from him, is that he lets me think that I can do what I want. And in the process of doing that, that's where he catches me out. Does that make sense? Yeah? So I might go to grab him, yeah? But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's going to happen. Um, again, what we're learning isn't an age-related thing. Um, so I've had people who apply this in their late 50s, 60s, and, and have results. Um, and I'm not talking about results in training, I'm talking about results in the real world. Because your training here should affect what happens out there. So you, you, know, you don't just get those people who are really good in the gym, but not so good when it comes to reality. Yeah? So there's different stages to everything. There's the beginning of the grab, the middle of the grab, and then the end of the grab when it's landing. Yeah? Either way, you learn to deal with every stage of that. Yeah? And even, some things are even worse when it comes to holds. Say holds... Uh, like this, yeah? Um, you know, can you deal with that? Yeah? There are no holes in what we do. Does that make sense? Yeah? We try and plug up every hole that we find in the environment. Yeah? Oh, here. Yeah? There. Oh, yeah? Oh. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah? So, um, everything is... <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> but you see what happens again? Sorry, it's a warrior or so. <laughs> Uh, tend to do those kind of things, but there are real, um, there are really, really no holes in what we do. Yeah, there's a solution for everything. Yeah, and if somebody can get you in something, you can get out of it. Yeah. Now again, the stuff that we hope to learn, should you we decide to do a course, will be quick and easy to learn and intuitive. But you have to practice. Yeah. Um, any more areas of concern? Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Well, thank you for the opportunity, sir, for allowing me just to do a demonstration. And thank you, uh, Ismail, for your opportunity in that as well. And regardless of whether or not you uh, train with me. Okay? Yeah, what should you do with the knife after taking it? Very good question. As a young black man, right, what do I do with the knife? Have you got it? Yeah? I'll do this. Yeah? Or it goes down the nearest drain or in the nearest bin. Right? For the simple fact that if somebody comes halfway through what you're doing, what do they see? This, it might have started like this. Here, I take the knife, but then what do they see? Even though he was the attacker. So the first thing you do is you learn to hide the knife. Yeah? Then the second thing you do is you learn to dispose of the knife, i.e. down a drain or in a dustbin. Yeah? Uh, because especially with our... Um, you know what it's like, young black man, young Asian man with a knife, yeah? All of a sudden it can come back on you. So for me, the best thing to do is hide it, put it in the dustbin, get it away from the other person as much as possible. Because once you've got the knife in him anyway, you've got the tactical advantage, yeah? Any more quick questions? Don't try and stab it. Yeah, that's a very good point. Legally, yeah? Sorry, legally. So Ismail does his stab. I do my... Disarm, and then I go, there's a name for that, murder. 
Yeah? And even you got all you guys, as much as you want to know, as much as you want to know stuff, you know at the end of the day, I think even if you did do that, it would be quite a difficult thing to live with. Does that make sense? You know, so you've got to worry about your own soul. You know? Um, so you see what I mean? Yeah? Uh, there are no hundred percent guarantees. There's a possibility that you might get caught, but he's not gonna there's a good chance he won't survive. Yeah? Any more questions? No? Well, thank you. Sorry, sir. Now, during this demonstration and presentation, and thank you very much for doing it, and um, Israel, is a one very important thing that was mentioned, and maybe sort of bypassed us, I don't know, but Ed called violence a language, right? He called it a language, and he's absolutely right, because in this world, we need to speak two languages. One is a language of peace, and the other one is a language of violence, and the wise person is fluent to both. So this is why this kind of training for us is very, very important, inshallah. And hopefully we might be able to do arrange something with the brothers and, and see if they're able to do something. But arranging it is one thing. You, you, mashallah, there's good interest here and keenness here. Once something has been arranged, then you, you've got to show commitment and then attend these lessons because you know what they're doing, they've been doing it for years and years and years. And for our benefit, they've been you know, taking their time and showing us very, very slowly how these things work. And as you know for yourself, what happens out there happens in real time and very, very quickly. You don't have that space and time and all that kind of thing. But only by practicing those movements that we've seen today is that you know, we're going to prepare ourselves. One lesson isn't enough. One demonstration isn't enough. You know, so, inshallah, if we're able to sort something out, then our part is that we've got to commit to something and attend, inshallah. It's like a lot of help. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And hopefully I'll get a chance to meet you all again in nice circumstances. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh.